Hello everyone, I'm Bart Massey. Welcome once again to Open Source Software. I hope everyone's staying safe and well out there in these difficult times. Today I want to talk to you briefly about money in open source. Uh, in particular, sort of how you get paid. The GitHub folks have a nice open source guide article about this that I can also recommend, but I thought I'd run you through my notes that I've developed over the years on this topic, which take a complimentary but maybe a little different slant. So how do you get paid for open source? What's the deal there? And the fact of the matter is that most open source development, 90% according to a survey a few years back, is done by paid professionals, people who are paid for doing their open source work as employees of some company that is involved with or benefits with open source. That's 90% of core development. The numbers are very complicated. So employers are looking all the time for folks who are going to be able to participate in the free and open source ecosystem. That's something that is of benefit to them. We'll talk about the reasons for that a little bit at the end here. So what do you need? What do you need? How do you get yourself a day job in open source? Well, this course is a good start. You need to have some experience with open source software. You need to be comfortable with how it works, what it is, what's out there, that sort of thing. And hopefully we've exposed you a little bit to that. You need to have a track record usually of contribution to open source. That's really, really helpful if you're trying to get a job in open source or convert your job inside a company into open source. You should have a GitHub presence. It should be visible. You should be, if you work with large projects, you should be in their commit logs and it should be visible that you are. So that people know that this isn't something you just are interested in or like to talk about. It's something you do on a regular basis. Finally, you need to have a good understanding of how the open source ecosystem ecosystems work. Uh, you need to be familiar with licensing. We have had a little bit of talk about licensing and legal stuff and about IP rules. That's a topic that, frankly, employers expect people like you to be their experts in. They want you to understand maybe not as much as an attorney does about the law, but certainly most of what there is to know about how the law is handled inside the open source ecosystem. And so that's something you need to get yourself familiar with right away. And you need to understand how the open source community works, how organizations run, what exactly is the community view on things that go on, how do people treat things? And so that kind of process view, an organizational view of what the open source community is, that's a huge asset when you're looking for open source work. And a lot of this you can learn on the job. It isn't like you have to know it all day one, but the more you do know on day one, the more desirable you'll be to employers. And that's definitely the path of least resistance to getting paid for open source. Another popular option, which a number of my friends are involved with as well, is to go as a contractor consultant, to actually have experience typically in some hot free or open source technology. A decade ago, it was Ruby on Rails. These days, it might be, well, any one of 50 things. The world's gotten complicated. Um, and probably React and JavaScript stuff last year or the year before. If you have experience with a hot open source tech that companies want to deploy, they may not have the in-house expertise to do it, or they may not be able to afford a full-time person to do it, but they might be able to pay someone on a contract or consulting basis to handle their issues. I'm actually involved right now as a consultant in a legal case around open source, and that's been a great, that's a great there again, side job thing to do sometimes. It's also, for some people, their whole career. I have friends who work as consultants and contractors and that's what they do. One thing to keep in mind is that consultant con and contractor salaries, when you look at them, tend to look really high. What you have to understand is without the benefits provided by an employer, without insurance and retirement money and so forth, Fourth, you probably need to make about twice as much, plus the work's 
irregular and not dependable, you probably need to be, a good industry rule of thumb is that you should be asking for twice the hourly rate you'd get in industry just to kind of break even. So, you know, watch out for thinking you're gonna get rich this way. Typically it's a, a job, just like a employment job would be a job. It's less stable, it can be more interesting, it's probably about the same lucrative for most people. You know, it is what it is. And you really wanna, yeah, keep your options open. One of the problems here is that, you, like I say, if 10, 15 years ago you were a Ruby on Rails person, there are probably still Rails jobs out there. I know there are, I know people who do them, but you know, the technology's on a, de on a decline. You're gonna have to have a plan B for when your expertise runs out. Either you've developed expertise in a newer hot technology or you have a plan to transition into corporate or you're planning to go back to school. You know, one of the things that's easy to forget to do as a contractor or a consultant is look into the near future, look five, 10 years ahead. Another way to get paid for open source is to start a software project that's interesting and set up a nonprofit dedicated to your project. And that's actually a very aggressive, ambitious thing to do. But a lot of times it can work out really well. There again, you probably aren't going to get to that spot right away with any of the projects you start in this course. But it is a thing that can be really super engaging. Typically, it's not going to pay well, but it might pay enough to keep you in shoes and give you a place to live. And it can be incredibly rewarding to develop a project you find important in this way. There's a couple of sort of standard ways. The modern way, of course, is to use sort of social funding venues like Kickstarter or Patreon as ways to try to get the funding you need to keep things going. And you know, typically a Patreon funded thing is going to be a side thing. You can do advertising, you know, there's lots of ways you could do this. The other way to go is to look for a grant or some sponsorship from a company or something. If your project is important, somebody may be willing to fund it just to make sure it happens and so you should look out for that. One piece of advice I'll give you, although this is changing, the latest laws, federal laws in the US are a little more lax. Historically, it's been a really terrible idea to set up a nonprofit foundation legally yourself. Having been involved in the setting up of one, I can attest that it was pretty nightmarishly difficult and expensive, it required a lot of lawyer effort and a lot of messing around. There are organizations, there are umbrella organizations such as Software in the Public Interest who will take you, if you successfully apply to them, will take your open source project under their wing as part of their nonprofit corporation. I highly recommend that route if you can arrange it because it really reduces the amount of grief you have around funding and leaves you with the problem of building software. Another way, and this is one of the things I really want you to think about hard as this course winds down, is maybe you want to go into business yourself doing open source. Is open source compatible with having a business? Absolutely. People make money as entrepreneurs in open source businesses all the time. It's risky, but guess what? Any business startup is incredibly risky. And that's why I always encourage anybody who thinks they might want to start a business someday to start it sooner rather than later. One of the truths of life is that as your life goes on, you get more and more commitments, more and more obligations. It becomes more and more difficult for you to take the risks you need to start a company. It's a fact of small companies in technology that they have a 90% failure rate. Second, startups actually do substantially better, so you'd ideally like to have the time and find the resources to start a second one when your first one fails. Uh, I think this is a fantastic thing to try. I have started and failed to start up myself before, and I don't regret it for a moment. Uh, there's some big upsides. Obviously, if it really blows up, you can get rich. That's neat. But even if you don't, you still have full control sort of over your own product. That's neat. So it has all the obvious advantages. Plus, open source is a great distribution channel. It's a great way to get attention in the community 
and get your stuff out there with people who are willing to try it out and distribute it and share it and talk about it and review it in a way that commercial off offerings often have to pay a giant sales force to do and even then struggle with. And of course, a thing that's easy to write off but is really important is that you'll get contributions, free contributions to your project. And that is incredible. That's something that nobody's given Microsoft partly because they wouldn't take it. And so by putting yourself in a position where you can cooperate and collaborate with the community rather than being adversarial with them, you put yourself in a position to really reduce your costs and efforts and make things go smoother. There's some downsides. Probably the biggest downside is that if you're trying to go for conventional funding models, let's say venture capital model or angel investor model, one of the things they ask is what assets does your company have and typical or will it have? And typically one of those assets that they value sort of, I think, irrationally highly is patents and copyrights for software that you're building. You won't own those copyrights. You may own some patents, but that gets really complicated in an open source setting. And so that's going to make it harder for you to get outside funding. That doesn't mean you shouldn't get outside funding. You always should, but it makes it harder. And especially if you choose to go the free software route, GPL, the business models that you use to make money tend to be more complicated. You can look at things like open core or freemium models. You can look at things where there are advertising and other revenue channels. There's a lot of ways to go to make money, absolutely. But you know, for your first business, there's a lot to be said for building a thing and then selling it for more than it costs to build it. Um, and that's harder in the open source setting. Not impossible, but harder. Uh, good example, recently, my friend Keith Packard, with some help from me, built a hardware random number generator. It's a little open hardware, open source device. So literally the full schematics and PC board layouts and the software for the, that drives the thing are all available absolutely as an open source project. And yet we were able to build these and sell them for a respectable markup because people would rather buy them from us than build them themselves. And you know, that's, that's, that was a successful business. We, we got out a reasonable dollars per hour compared to what we put into it. If you wanna do this, talk to me, talk to somebody, both the Portland State Business Accelerator and the Oregon Technology Business Center are startup incubators that have great advice, including some pro bono advice to potential startups. I have advised those organizations for some time. Uh, there's a lot of people around town who wanna to help you, the Service Corps of Retired Executives, et cetera. So if you're interested, I'd really urge you not to put off your entrepreneurial dream. I'd say plan to start soon or you know as soon as possible while you still are unencumbered enough, hopefully, that you can afford to fail, because that means you can afford to succeed. So, I mentioned at the beginning, you know, companies would rather have you not start your own business, but come work for them. What is it that corporations think about when they think about open source these days. And of course, corporations don't view anything. It's important not to anthropomorphize corporations. And when I say, how does corporate view open source, I really mean how do the people who make up a typical corporate organization view open source. Anyway, at this point, everybody understands. 15 or 20 years ago, somebody did a nice survey of companies and asked is open asked the CEOs and CTOs is open source used in your company and they got like pretty uniform no's no we don't use any open source software and then they surveyed the line engineers of those same companies and they're like oh yeah we got open source everywhere there was a real lack of understanding of management from management about what they even were using what they had that's pretty well changed i think most CEOs and CTOs in America these days who do anything related to technology understand that they're using open source and what the technology is there, and they know they're using it a lot. So nobody wants to get crosswise on it. It's certainly the case that those people pretty uniformly prefer open source licenses and prefer not to have 
viral licenses. Uh, the GPL is something that they still struggle with, but these days they've learned not to be vocal about that. Microsoft in particular spent 15 or 20 years attacking the GPL and saying how terrible it was and stuff. And Microsoft didn't benefit from that in any way. All it did is make a lot of people angry and sort of disprove Barnum's adage there was such a thing as bad publicity. And even though they still are pretty allergic to the GPL, they've pretty well shut up about it because it they understand that it's a fact of life and they'd rather cooperate with the open source ecosystem than fight it. Bottom line is that everybody understands that this is not going anywhere, that things released under free and open source licenses are at the backbone of almost every business. They're, they're a vital part of almost every software ecosystem. And so it's not a question of whether at this point, it's a question of how much and where. And so that's an important thing to keep in mind. When I started teaching this course 20 years ago, there was at least the perception of a sharp divide between proprietary and open source software. These days, you know, it's all been stirred together and you're gonna be wanting to think about money and how it works in an ecosystem where these things do coexist and do intertwine. I hope that was helpful. It's always fun for me to talk about. I hope you're, like I said before, I hope you're staying safe and well out there during this difficult time. Thank you very much for listening. And I imagine I will talk to you again soon.